Hello and welcome to the Cybersecurity Sharing and Solving Session for the Arts. My name is Benjamin J. Allard and I'm the Project Manager for the Independent Media Arts Alliance. Today, we brought together participants from the art world who wanted to talk about cybersecurity in their organizations. We've worked upstream to find common issues and now we're going, going to try to address them. So you have a privileged window into our virtual meeting. If you're interested in learning more about cybersecurity or digital risk management, we invite you to visit Cyber Safe and Sound uh, website. It's a resource that brings together uh, basic knowledge and slightly more advanced protocols for art organizations. You can find the resource at ima.ca slash cybersecurity. We're also fortunate to have with us two of the experts who helped us to create this resource, Jean-Philippe Descarimatio and Geneviève Lajeunesse. Geneviève so um, thank you for uh, joining us. So I was telling you that we worked in small groups on concrete issues, and we're going to tackle three of them today. So to present those issues, we have uh, Peter Senmark, Tori Fleming, and Matt Waterworth. Thank you very much for playing the game and being the spokesperson for your groups. So in turn, they will present their challenges and the other participant will comment and then we'll go back to them uh, to find out what they remember. So without further ado, uh, let's go to our first speaker, Peter Senmark. And here, uh, I invite you to um, share the first, uh, the first challenge you have for us today. Uh, yes, thank you, Benjamin. Um, yes, we were talking in our group about uh, you know, access to data. The fact that as public organizations, media arts organizations, we have different levels of um, you know, usage, creation of data, and also usage and access to data. So, for example, we have staff, uh, but we also have members or artists creating works that might be saving data on our, our, our uh, gear or if a, a distribution center, uh, people, clients who want to view videos and, and things since everything is turned into data now. So uh, we find ourselves with multiple um and then, of course, backing up because of the importance of having backups. We have multiple backups of uh, our data. Um, and then we don't know whether, you know, we can get rid of some stuff. Uh, we, we do need to also know in terms of access, uh, what are the best practices in terms of uh, in ensuring access to the data that people are, are creating. So, for example, uh, using cloud uh, storage so that people, members can access uh, data or that staff or board members can access data across, you know, working from different devices. So there's a multiple, uh, so it's a multitude of issues that we're, we're facing. I Great. Think thank, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. So now we have a uh, two minutes for the um, consultants. So that is our uh, two cybersecurity experts, but also uh, the other spokesperson. To just investigate with Peter, you know, if you have questions for him to understand a bit more what the challenge here. So I have two minutes here. So my first question would be, what is the, um, what is the challenge in knowing which of the data set is the original one? Do you have any sort of uh, concerns into somebody inserting the wrong type of data into a data set? Or is it more of a, we need to have historical records of what we're doing. So we need to know version two, is it version two or is it Friday version two slash, you know, know what I mean? When, when these files just kind of multiply on their own. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. And uh, obviously, you know, like many people, you often look at the date, you'll say, oh, that's the most recent. So if it was changed, it might be the one that's, that's necessary. I don't know. It's, it's, it's also because we, as organizations, we're sort of archiving data, you know, we're archiving, whether it's, you know, minutes, especially now as we move more and more to pure digital stuff, you know, we have to keep track. We, we, we are obliged to keep uh, data. So, uh, you know, I, like I mentioned in our group, I err on the side of caution. I keep, you know, multiple copies of everything <laughs> anyway. So we have data storage is somewhat cheap so we can do that. But even then we run into the problem of sort of, uh, you know, Ac managing it and accessing and having. 
I don't know. I, you know, I don't even so, know if there is an original document. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have the time for maybe uh, we have 30 seconds left for this round. So other questions to uh, Peter before we give uh, advice and thoughts? I have another one if no one has one. Um, yes, go ahead. So you say you have too many clouds. As they're like, what is the challenge in consolidating your data? You could just, you know, why hasn't this happened? Is my question. Ha, huh. uh, I don't know. I guess because you know, uh, like with, uh, even shifting to the cloud, uh, cloud services because of ease of facilitation, and this has increased over the past year because we're you know working remotely and working together remotely. So uh, you know, there's there's all the different ones, and then. We haven't decided on, you know, using one or n another, uh, and so you end up using multiple, and then there's passwords for everything. Uh, so there's password management as well. And like uh, what we, a little summary is like there's there's levels, there's you know um, you know backups, and then there's access to all that data, and then there's levels of access. I think this has been summarized in the cybersecurity documents too, but it's still we're still trying to chart our way, like what is the best practice out of this i mean mm -hmm. I, you know well I, th I think that's a good uh, thing so we are in a we are in a schedule now we don't want to you know use too much of your time so i propose that we go right away to the consultant uh advice so we have uh, around six minutes here um geneviève jean-philippe tori and matt uh what do you think of this case does that ring you know something that is you know familiar do you have um some suggestions more questions so here we go. Uh, Peter, you listen for this uh, next round, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all your advice. So here we go. So having overlapping and multiple uh, uh, solutions within a, a technology stack is something that's very common. Uh, most businesses or organizations will have between uh, of doing 40 and 70 different applications uh, for the various tasks that they use in a, uh, on any given day. So don't feel bad about it. <laughs> if you don't know where to start, uh, that's a common issue also. Uh, right now, what you're, you do, uh, you seem to have an issue. I, I don't know the budget of your organization, obviously, but uh, um, I, I, uh, a low cost solution will be to uh, just write down all of the solutions that you're using right now, uh, who has access to what, and how, that, uh, how are those access uh, controlled, essentially. Um, managing data sets on multiple devices is not an issue uh, as far as the feature is concerned because most or if not all major uh, cloud providers provide uh, uh, granular uh, permissions on given files or folders and or uh, and uh, 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 sharing capabilities for to people outside uh, your organization. So, I mean, whether it's Amazon or, or Google, you'll find... Uh, something to fit your need, but uh, the data sets how they're organized, how they're accessed, that's in your purview. And that's something that you have control over. So uh, a good old pen and paper uh, activity that you can do is just write down everything you're using right now, uh, who has access to what, and start consolidating. You probably probably don't need to have a Google Drive and uh, an AWS bucket and uh, a Dropbox account shared with about 20 people in a five to 10 year period that uh, some people may still have access to while they shouldn't have. Uh, so it's, it's, a, a, it's sort of a, an analog discovery that you need to do on your, uh, your, your, your technology stack. Um, that's probably where I would, I would start. Uh, that would probably resolve, uh, well, several of your issues, uh, too many cloud providers, uh, lack of consistency in accessing data uh, internally, um, and, uh, as far as, well, that, that's, you, 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 made a good point, Peter saying that, is there even such a thing as an original document anymore? That's, uh, that, that that's, a that's a good point. Uh, you also, you will also find usually that cloud providers provide, a historical, uh, uh, copies of your, uh, documents. So you don't need to manually copy and, and, and create different documents. Um, a lot of, uh, Cloud providers have uh, versioning controls uh, uh, in house, so to speak. So uh, that does the uh, that does the trick for you. Great, thank you very much, Jean Philippe. We still have some times to hear from other consultants. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, I add that 
think of it as a journey. So if you were to embark upon a journey and you're, you know, packing your bags, then you need to know what you have. You also will tend to maybe pack light. So for some cloud providers where there's maybe a higher cost, you want to evaluate if that's where you want to go. Well, don't like have a plan for what you're putting in there so that you can pull it back if you, you feel this decision doesn't really fit your organization. Um, there are some specialized tools that would do things like data discovery and deduplication. So you, you definitely can look for tools that do that. Um, and you really need to, you mentioned the devices in your initial question, you really take this into account in, in how you map out what you're going to do. So will you need to be accessing this from tablets, from phones frequently? Where are you going to be editing the documents if you're going to be inputting some data in the field? Because that will orient the choices that you make. It's fine to have multiple clouds, if anything for resiliency, but you need to have some way to account for, well, for example, we know accounting data is always going to be on that cloud and it's going to be managed with a named account, not with a, an individual's account so that if there's a change in the organization, we don't lose that access. Um, and yeah, that, that would be what I'd add to that. Thank you very much. I'm very curious also about the other consultants at the moment. So in your organizations, right? So you are you have arts organization. Have you faced some similar issues and how have you uh, went about solving them? Tori, Matt, Matt, yes. I think yeah, no, I, I oh, oh, please. I, I was gonna say that I think that this relates a lot to the question that is gonna come up in number two, because I think a lot of it is overlapping. Um, we used to have internal servers, which I found solved a lot of cybersecurity issues and a lot of these where are things kept issues, but it just became, it's impossible in a current like pandemic setting when we need to be working from home and even was becoming impossible before that um, with employees traveling. So managing the cloud continues to be an issue and also uh, another issue is we have to kind of keep up with it as Google changes or as whatever we're using changes. So I don't have solutions necessarily, but I do have sympathy for the problem. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt, your turn. Yeah, what, one thing that that sort of uh, brings to mind for me is, is that um, making uh, you know film, film content, we're, we're generating a lot of video content um, and just data sizes in general are are a challenge to to solve. I mean, uh, you can you can get a one terabyte um, Dropbox plan, and and actually we probably have quite a quite a lot more data than that if you if you were to gather up all the video content that we have at a very high resolution. So uh, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's not easy to for for us certainly. It's uh, not a one stop shop. And and um, Peter also mentioned uh, that the a bit of security around that, which um, uh, I think my group is also concerned about. Um, so yeah, and, and it's interesting, Tori, I, I've been in another organization where we did the same. We had, we had our own server in place and then it became, okay, how do we access that offsite even prior to COVID? And, and that was not nearly as easy as we had hoped. And uh, uh, yes, uh, also, also, um, uh, sympathetic to, to this challenge for sure. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, that was our first round of advice. Peter, I'd like to return to you. Is there anything that brings some bells that you can put on your backpack and bring into your journey with you? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. I've been taking notes in good old fashioned pen and paper. So that's the first step. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's just, we, it's just getting a handle on it. And this, this, uh, cybersecurity thing is, is a great, uh, tool for, for helping to focus. You know, I, um, we were just about to get a password manager and I was just looking for which one to choose. And, um, uh, I think, you know, we sort of stumbled into, uh, the, the increasing amount of data that we're creating and then the need to back it up, the need to share, the need to control access. So this is all very helpful. Um, in terms of us, you know, so I, I'm, I'm going to actually think, I think drawing it out on paper and doing a sort of uh, a, a grand view of where we're at and then sort of seeing how we can uh, sort things out will, will really help. 
Uh, and and but I should just add on to what Matt said. You know, we're just getting into we have 4K cameras now, and very few. You know, we're just getting into four. We have computers that can do 4K editing, and it just like exponentially <laughs> booms the amount of data storage that is uh, we're running into. <laughs> I was it on a is. set yesterday, and we were shooting 6K. Oh, <laughs> wow. And it will not get uh, any better, right? It's just going to continue that way. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and everyone thank for you. this uh, first round. We'll go oh, to uh, our... Thanks to everyone for your comments. So thank you on behalf of our group. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you will uh, stay on as well because now you are transformed into a consultant to, uh, for the second topic presented by uh, Tori, Tori Fleming. So um, I had little birds told me that some, uh, some questions might be very similar, but as you are different people with different organizations, I propose that we keep those challenges uh, the way they ha you have written them and we'll be able to look at uh, different perspectives or continue on an issue, an issue with topic two and three as we go along. So, um, Tori, now it's your time. Please, uh, please introduce us to your challenge. So, our challenge was how might we make sure no passwords are shared to the wrong staff member, and what to do when the staff member is no longer working for the organization, given that our organization frequently uses contract staff and has semi-regular turnover. And I think that maybe something to expand upon in this question within CFAT's context is um, that it's not just contract staff, but something we come up with a lot is our, we have a working board who holds a lot of important roles with us too. So between all of those people's contract staff, board and staff, there's a lot of people who are coming and going from our data. And we also are using a lot of cloud servers and we have no real process for when somebody is not holding their role anymore or for when they leave. And if they leave slowly, we often do that process or come up with some form of a process slowly. And if they leave abruptly, it often feels very panicked to get all of the things back. Mm -hmm. um, and the last point I wanted to expand upon for this was Another issue with that is sometimes when we are trying to make sure that we change the passwords and everything like that, the actual owner of the cloud documents can become an issue. Uh, and then we'll realize that maybe somebody is the owner on their personal account and it didn't appear that way. And it feels like we're constantly managing pulling back CFATS documents into our actual possession. So I see a lot of ads uh, nodding uh, in approval. So uh, now we go to the question rounds to understand a little bit more your topics or your Tori, you can answer briefly to uh, the questions uh, that consultants may have. Geneviève, I think you're muted. Excellent. So my first question would be, oftentimes when we see things like this, where a lot of personal accounts are being used is, is there a budget and is there a plan to acquire a solution that would enable the sharing creation of documents internally? Yes, so we've recently um, bought a proper G Suite account so that we can use Google Drive. Uh, but the thing that I have found has happened is a lot of workers, especially in the contract worker context, have a lot of Google Drives and they have a lot of emails connected. And I think it just becomes one of those things where maybe it's uh, just a matter of more due diligence. But when you get up the little email that says Tori would like to request access, I think often people don't see Tori at Gmail would like to request access. They just see my name and then they say yes. Um, so I think there's a honest slip up that happens, but that's the best solution we have so far is having a proper, like our at CFAT emails connected to G, G Suite. Um, so that keeps it in-house, at least with the core staff, but not so much with board members. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, now we are um, keeping for the question round. So is there uh, other questions to s understand better this uh, challenge? Peter, would you like to, um, to ask a question? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, I, first of all, I, I've shared this, you know, experience. We have to. So we've. I've had to do that. Change passwords or or, or remove uh, staff members' emails from access to certain services. Um, and I guess the question would be, you know, um, how is. But I, I think this is a question for our experts. What what would be uh, the the best process is set up so that you're prepared for you know it seems like we're doing inventing it each time because by the time you have a turnover of staff you're using different software or different you have different passwords uh, this past year we've seen I've seen a multiplication of password you know creation for different multiple different services so. Um, uh, is if is the use of a password manager going to simplify this task? If a person, you know, if you change the, the access to the password management software, does that work to you so you don't have to change all the passwords? Or so maybe the question here is, uh, Tori, rapidly, do you have a password manager? We just got one very very recently, so it's new to us. Um, seems to be going well. Uh, but we also haven't had any turnover since we got the password manager. And I think that that was actually a reaction to having turnover. So um, we haven't dealt with any of these issues in the two weeks experience we have with our password manager. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was the time for the questions. So now I propose that we go into the consulting uh, moment. So Tori, you can uh, listen to all those advice that our um, wizards of uh, data management <laughs> have for us. Uh, um, yeah, I open the floor for the consultants for uh, six or seven minutes. Well, on folder and file ownership uh that's um well the end now they the the initial head nodding was because i we've seen that many many times in the past and we've had this issue on our end also in the past and, and it's a common it's a common topic um uh the simple fact that you're highlighting this as an issue shows great awareness so that's good on you uh and it's a great first step of improving your, your posture uh, account ownership and uh, not account ownership but folder and file ownership um if you want to solve or at least improve that uh, issue, it needs to be associated with probably, I would say, a title and not a person, uh, say, associated with a Gmail account, uh, uh, director of IT at gmail.com instead of John Doe at gmail.com. Uh, that requires, obviously, a bit of a, 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 a uh, initial uh, uh, process building and then constructing your your structure and uh, uh, internal structure, but um, that's going to solve you a lot of headache down the road, especially if you switch uh, cloud providers, if you have many cloud providers. Uh, that will solve the issue of having a, 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 an account owned uh, or a folder or file owned by someone who's now outside your organization who may have left on bad terms and who may have access to information that he should he or she should not have um so that, that that's a, a probably my first reflex i would say that is probably like associated with a, a generic uh, account uh, type or, or title type and uh whoever needs to have access to that gmail account or whoever whatever account is associated with uh, you can easily manage it in a a directory service like Microsoft Azure or, or an LDAP system or, or whatever you use internally to manage users and group policy objects and stuff like that, um, which you may or may not have. Um, password managers, uh, that's great. That's always good. You can manage actually uh, the uh, account passwords for those uh, title related uh, accounts. Uh, so that's good, especially if your password manager has a shared option for sharing passwords between multiple users of uh, the same password managers. That's always a big one. Uh, yeah, I would start with this, definitely. Perfect. Thank you. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, I'd look to how you can craft policies around sharing with external co collaborators. You might want to not do that and give consultants accounts in your organization depending on cost and, and how practical that is. And I just want to bring to your attention that passwordless authentication exists. There's more and more vendors that are moving into that space where you're essentially using some sort of continuous session or some other attestation that 
the pe person at the other end is who they say they are. And so you don't have to manage a password. You don't have to give them that credential. So you, you can cut the access at the, at the service level and you delight your user because they're not having to remember yet another password, which that also gives you that, you know, no reuse there. So of course, if you're using a password manager, that's less of a problem, but there's always this one account that someone wants to try just for something and they'll use sunshine one, two, three for it. And the next thing you know, in six months, you have a data incident. So, yeah. Thank you. Matt, Peter, do you have um, similar questions for your own organizations or faced some, uh, something? What are your uh, words of advice? I'm actually, um, I am a contract uh, employee <laughs> sort of right now uh, in, in this capacity. Uh, I have been a past uh, vice president of, of our organization as well. Um, so I, I, I love it and I, I, I'm thankful for the trust that I, I, I receive from, from our permanent staff. Um, but the, uh, this, but now in this role, this is the first time I've ever used a password manager and, uh, and yeah, I, I do see some value in it, but, but that was really great to hear because the, uh, the other thing is I, as a contract employee, I, we're using a password manager and it has its own password, but I can still see all the passwords that are associated with it. So, um, I would do worry that that's, that it, it sounds like that's a solution to that, uh, Genevieve, is that right? It can be. You always have the problem of having. Do you do you have the right admin at the right place in your flow? Um, oftentimes, organizations are shocked when they hear that you know my system admin can read my emails. Uh, of course, but that's not always a known thing. So you really need to have a policy for this. So, for example, we know we're going to need to do password resets. Who has access to this, and what is the process to get to that? Is it through a particular you know, endpoint that you need uh, authorization from a manager to open? Like it can, be, it can be anything that fits the organization, but you need a process. We need a process. That could have been an alternative title for Cyber Safe and Sound. Uh, Peter, do you have um, some thoughts about that? Um, yeah, um, I, I think, I think one of the, the key interests I, I had coming into this um, session is, was uh, policy, uh, precisely what Cynthia was talking about. Like, what's our, how do we set up what, you know? And so when you're setting up a policy, then you're putting together what will be a process for all the different staff and stuff. And I, and I think to some degree, um, well, we use Google for nonprofits. And so we, we switched all our emails over to that. So it's, possible to you know as staff go we can create and and also uh, you know delete a, a, an email we chose to personalize all our emails so that if people are contacting us they know who you know it's not director or something like that but then we can still change the if a staff person leaves them we can remove that email from the the, the google uh, for nonprofits account and so on i don't i don't know i think i think uh the issue for me is is what data is extremely sensitive. I mean, a lot of our data is maybe not so sensitive as just, you know archive, but for certain things like accounting or, and yes, they're they're operating on different um, services. In fact, that are not accessible to other even you know, to all the staff. So, I guess it's the it comes back to what's the policy and finding uh, the different questions. And I've heard some good ones already in terms of, you know, well password authentication uh, list. So it's just getting a handle on the whole thing because it seems to have mushroomed, and digital use has mushroomed so much. But uh, I'm hoping to come out of this with a, 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 a plan for creating policy for our organization. Mm -hmm. So we'll very quickly, very soon move to the uh, third topic, but is there any other um, final words about this particular situation? No, great. So I propose we return to um, our original client, uh, Tori. So is there anything that you thought was uh, particularly interesting in what our consultant told you? Uh, yeah, I think that having a proper data policy, I think there's a lot of agreement among our core staff, which is there's only three of us. 
about how to handle data, but I'm not actually sure that's a conversation we ever have with people like board members who have access to all the board documents. So maybe expanding the idea of what our policy is and who it's for seems really important. And also, I mean, now it seems kind of obvious, but the the using people's titles rather than, than their names could be a very simple fix to a lot of problems. Even just like on a very short term thing, I just came back from maternity leave and for a whole year, everything that was created was with somebody else's name, even though she had the same title as me. And uh, now I have to take back those accounts back to my name. And that does seem like a very simple thing that we could change. <laughs> so yeah, I could hear. Great. Yeah, we have to see cybersecurity not has a huge thing that we need to eat all at once, a huge cake, right? But like small changes that we do and we tweak here and there. And uh, yeah, and, and let's go to the third topic for other little things that we can tweak here and there. So presented by uh, Matt Waterworth, um, we have a third and final topic. Um, so Matt here... Um, please present your challenge. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just sorry. I'm going to uh, go back to... Uh, yes, board. it is also in the shared screen that you... Yes, uh, I see that. See. Um, sure, okay. So, uh, so really, I, I think our, our sort of overarching topic is, is about passwords. Um, and it seems like we've maybe uh, touched on, on some of this, but um, obviously... Uh, there are different uh, different roles in, in, in our organizations, um, uh, and, and obviously, cer certain data should be available to um, those peoples and the people, and certain data should perhaps not. Um, and of course, uh, similar to Tori's uh, topic, the uh, short-term employees or, or, or contract employees um, create complexity for us around um, the security of those files. And uh, uh, definitely, um, potentially, some of uh, these organizations um, are, are working with budget that maybe cannot maintain a proper um, password manager. So, um, so I think, yeah, some of some of the same topics here, but uh, would love to uh, have a discussion around it. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and um, even if we have the same issue, two perspective and two uh, organizations might have different solutions, right? Uh, um, I think that's a, a useful thing to do. So uh, for the next two minutes, I invite our consultant to ask you questions to understand more your challenge. So uh, how many people in your organization? That's one. And two, do you have any kind of uh, uh, Active Directory esque uh, directory service to manage uh, policy or end user or accounts. Do you have any any of that? Yeah, I, I, I'm. I I can actually speak from sort of a unique position. I think being a current, uh, as I said earlier, current um, contract employee, but also uh, a past board member. Because I, having been a past board member who is no longer, uh, I, I actually did have access to to uh, folders on. W w we use a, a, a service called Box um, that uh, that I probably shouldn't have had access to once I was once my term was completed. Um, so we have, of course, our board members, which I believe is around ten, and then uh, sort of our our permanent staff is around three, and then we bring in all all manner of um, interns or step students or um, you know summer summer students as well. So. Uh, and and it can be um, you know over the course of a year quite a lot of coming and going from the non permanent staff. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Um, so does everybody need to edit the files, or can you have more of a, some people really need to know what's in the file, but they don't need the addition rights? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I for for me that is. I, I can't really speak to that too heavily. I wonder if someone else in our group is maybe the spearhead on that particular point. But um, in, in at CSF, it does feel, at least in my uh, time uh, on the staff, uh, sort of pretty, um, uh, our, our roles are pretty well defined. And, and so we're not really going into each other's sort of digital worlds very, very much unless we do and we're collaborating on a document. Um, and that is uh, Google Docs usually. So. Um, so yeah, access around that, 
Um, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm speaking for my group as well. Uh, if there's anything in particular, I don't know if they're allowed to chime in, um, but uh, there may be and other it, points there. And am I hearing this correctly that you're using multiple cloud services to have those files? I guess we are, yeah, sort of, uh, sort of without, because of course, Google, the services we use around Google uh, is one and then Box as well, for sure. And, okay. and who knows what other staff may be using something independently. Uh, <laughs> so I All propose right. that this will do for our questions, per questions period, uh, and I invite our consultants, so here is uh, Peter and Troy to, uh, Peter, Troy, Jean-Philippe and Geneviève, to, you know, think with this challenge and see what kind of, of uh, advice we can give. The first advice I would give is you need to map out those user groups and have, name persons that are accountable for making sure that these are maintained in a way that's up to date. So most of the cloud providers, if not all that we've named today, allow when you have a paid account or you know the 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 the, the account that's granted for uh, nonprofits to have group permissions. So you'll want to create those groups, and then you can, for example, on Google, you can remove some services for certain user groups. Uh, for Box, you can change the, the permission level on addition. So you, maybe they'll have only read-only access to some files. Um, but that would be my first thing. Like to have that Venn diagram of I sit here, do I need finance? Do I need IT? Do I need contracts? Do I need, you know, all of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that actually brings a, an interesting governance issue. Um, uh, <laughs> I've seen a bunch of places uh, just because some guy is the CEO doesn't mean he needs to have access to everything. Uh, and, and this is more common than most people may think. Uh, um, yeah. There's a reason why there's a granular aspect to access. Uh, uh, it's some, you, you really need to operate on a need to know basis uh, just because you have the right to know does not mean you need to know when you need to have access to certain things. Um, uh, for the company I work for, the CEO doesn't have access to most of the stuff I have. I have way more accesses than he does. And, you know, that's fine. That's my job. <laughs> you know, that's not his. His is to shake hands and get contracts and, 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 and the political aspect of it. So uh, you, you need to have the, the C-level. Well, I mean, obviously I'm speaking on a, from, from what I know or whatever the equivalent of C-level executives or suits or, 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 or uh, decision makers that you have on your side for this because uh, there's definitely a trickle down effect on this. If uh, the top brass don't really play by the rules, you will see an issue uh, trickling down with the, uh, the on the baseline. Definitely. Um, so it, there's always a governance aspect that you need to have uh, to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, it's never the most fun aspect to deal with, uh, but it's uh, you, there's no way you can just go around it. So just uh, just keep that in mind also. And I'll jump in with one last thing. Um, the, if the budget's too limited for a commercial password manager, that's perfectly fine, but you need to find a way to mitigate for those passwords that people are going to reuse from their personal lives. Um, so you can set these, these uh, platforms again to require some multi-factor authentication. It can be an app that an employee has on their personal devices. It can be some hardware keys going to show one to the camera and it's not going to work because of the background, but uh, these cost around $20. It would be an investment on the employer contractor's part, but they're going to reuse them everywhere in their life. They can secure their Facebook account with this. It's Once you get on board with these things, they you use them everywhere. And, and you, that, you will end up saving money in the long run, yeah. like way more than you will have to the initial uh, expenses of, of uh, rolling out a password manager or uh, a, a hardware-based two-factor authentication or stuff like that. It's yeah. really not that as expensive like versus what you need. You're going to end up dealing with in process and, and, and back and forth and, and, and uh, lost accounts and, and lost data and stuff like that. It's, it's going to cost way more than that. You just need to just like basically prove it to the brass and uh, that, that, that works every time. Or, or, or they can use personal devices and you're going to get something that will, you know, it, it doesn't add much friction. And if you need to temporarily disable it for security reasons, you'll have a policy for that, but you're at least protecting against somebody who's just done with passwords and done with, with that and have this one good password that they reuse everywhere. So 
that's uh that's a very low cost one that adds not too much friction and gets it done great thank you uh, do we have other um ideas uh from Peter or Tori, uh, or perhaps an angle that uh, you'd you'd like to invite Matt to uh, consider this problem from? Um, Peter here, I'll, I'll uh, add a, a comment because hearing Jean-Philippe talk about uh, the process in a, a sort of more corporate structure, it, it strikes me, and also hearing Matt talk about you know limited budget for software for commercial password management and so on. I, that also means that our organizations, media arts groups, don't have a budget for an IT person. We don't have IT departments. Uh, so what we're talking about today is, is distributed among you know, all the different. But it kind of suggests that uh, that, ha that kind of role has to be assigned to, or someone should pick up that role in the organization. In other words, assessing the uh, layers of secure access to files and the, and the security issues. So... Um, it's like we have to become our own IT uh, consultants. And it's possible since I've just become a consultant today. I didn't know how that happened, but uh, <laughs> there you go. So we, we, we have to take it on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tori. Yeah, I think what you were just saying about not having an IT department, that was on my brain too. But um, particularly if you're in a place where there's, primarily contract staff. Like I know as full-time staff with permanent jobs, this sort of thing often falls to the bottom of our list and we're here all the time, let alone if you're a contract staff and you're there to complete a very specific project, it would fall even further to the list. So I, I've been thinking within our context about maybe making some sort of actual schedule of these are the days that we review this stuff and make sure that it's everything's where it needs to be and making sure that there's a deadline for it because we're always going to get our grants in on time because there's a deadline that somebody's asking for but this sort of thing is can always go to the bottom of the list so maybe we need to be our own uh bosses and force these sorts of deadlines on ourselves yep Yes, exactly. And we have some comments from the chat here. Uh, someone asking maybe more precision or a list of some of these low budget solutions. So um, I propose perhaps that we, uh, since this is a, a given that from this particular challenge, maybe we can orient a little bit some of the advice and in, in seeing that in terms of uh, low budget for uh, the one or two minutes remaining. Um, well, I'm not exactly sure what low budget solution precisely yeah. we're referring to, but anything that has to do for multi-factor authentication, for example, uh, there's free applications that do that. Um, Google Authenticator, for example, would be one of these. Uh, in terms of the um, anything that has to do with group management, so if you're part of the, the Google for Nonprofit, I do believe this is included in the accounts. And otherwise, it's really define low costs because for some organization five dollar per seat might seem like a low cost and for another organization it might be a, too much of a cost for the benefit that's perceived so i'd say for this run through the actual budgeting of this so if you're you're saying well you know, this password manager is too expensive it's 150 bucks a year we don't have it how much time will somebody who is not their main job description are going to be you know, spending fixing password issues for other people and not providing the value that they're there for? So I find that oftentimes when we go through the rings of, of doing this, then the picture shifts a little bit. Um, and also when we look to software licenses, sometimes you might have some duplication. Maybe you're using three services that do essentially the same thing. And if you were to consolidate, you'll save there. And if you consolidate, you remove some of the complexity for the cybersecurity. So maybe that's an extra value. That's how I look at it. I always feel uncomfortable recommending specific solutions because this is a, like, it shifts really fast. And the decision that you make today in six months might sound a little bit outdated. Um, so the one advice piece I'd have there is, you need to put some time in, into your strategic planning to look at, you know, is our ser software serving us well? Is there anything better on the market right now? Are we happy with the way things are going? Uh, this will pay for itself in spades. 
Thank you very much. Jean-Philippe, I think you had uh, one uh, last thought before we go back to Matt. Well, I think you know, Geneviève pretty much said what I wanted to say. Like, um, There's a multiplicity of, of solutions in your tech stack usually. That's when you spend time of actually sitting down and say, oh, we're using this, this, this. We're paying for this and this and that, and we're not actually using it. So you might find your, even though you may have, a, maybe on a limited budget, you may find actually some leftover cash laying around for for uh, applications or, or, or solutions that you're not actually using. So uh, you may have more money than you think so. Uh, and just needs, as always, uh, it's, it's baby steps and it's fine if it's baby steps. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, you, it's a gradual improvement that you need to do in your in your posture, and this is gonna solve you a lot of headaches, headaches down the road. Uh, it's fine if it's not perfect; it's never gonna be perfect. Uh, uh, and and if the steps are to, uh, just awareness is already a massive step forward. And uh, if you can solve one issue in a year, that's one less headache that you'll have down the road. So it's, it's fine. Thank you so much. So let's return uh, finally with Matt to see if this conversation inspired you with your challenge. Uh, yeah, I would say absolutely. I've got some good notes here. And um, I think what it comes down to uh, for me and all three of these conversations we've had so far is that we really need to uh, create best practices. Um, also, the word policy is coming up a lot. Um, we really, yeah, seem to need a uh, strong process, especially when someone leaves, especially if it's not on good terms, right? That, that, that's concerning to me for sure. So um, a clear process around that, that, that everyone who, who's new to an organization um, knows going in, ideally would be my, would be my preference. Um, and, and maybe it's sort of a part of the, the sign on. So um, yeah, policy and, and, uh, and procedure uh, and uh, some best practices are, are what I'm taking away for sure. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And um, Gauls, these uh, were all the topics we prepared for you. So I hope you enjoyed them and hopefully you learned something. So thank you for listening to this conversation. Also, if you are curious about the first step or perhaps a first draft of those policies, well, you can find a lot of ideas and resources uh, to um, on cybersecurity in on cyber safe and sound. So please visit. Uh, uh, please visit it. Right, it's. Uh, at uh, imaa.ca slash cybersecurity. So um, yes, we have a lot of uh, those draft and uh, procedures uh, to help your art organization with uh, cybersecurity issue. So my name is Benjamin J. Allard, and on behalf of the Independent Media Arts Alliance team, I wish you a wonderful end of the day. <laughs>